here where we are uh, in Motoko. The Mother of Peace community started in 1994. But the very beginning, it started in 1989. It all emanated from the messages of Our Lady to a certain woman or certain lady in South Africa. Her name is Beverly, Mrs. Beverly Olbers. Married woman with three kids. And now when she started in 1989, she was uh, a little younger. Now she's in her 50s, late 50s. All her children are all grown up. And she still receives messages from our lady. The message is actually the very first message when she started receiving the message was that when our lady appeared to her, she didn't know who she was. She was just surprised to see a woman standing almost like halfway on the ground and halfway up. And this was a very simple woman dressed in gray with sort of a veil. She said it looked like a veil or a cloth covering her back only, but the front was open. And according to her, she couldn't tell the color of the person. She was not white, she was not black, she was, she was just something. She said, I don't know, but this was somebody very, very beautiful. She so she's never seen such beauty in her life. And uh, the old lady said to her, Beverly, I want you to build a chapel. And she thought she was hallucinating, she was not, was not real. She was in her house and she was preparing to be received in a, a guild. And this guild was the Schoenstatt guild. So she thought maybe I've prayed too much and I'm seeing things which are not true. And uh, she said, I want you to build my church, my chapel. This chapel will be a center of a community. And the name of the community shall be Mother of Peace. The purpose of the community is to prepare for the second coming of Christ, for our Lord Jesus Christ. And in preparation of the second coming of our Lord, there has to be, she was given seven cares that this community will sort of, these are activities or functions that will be carried out in this community. That is care given to people who are dying or who are sick with untreatable illnesses. And then she specifically said, such as AIDS, HIV, AIDS, and others. This was 1989, and here we had not known about HIV, AIDS. And then it's starting with children who are left by parents who die of these diseases, untreatable diseases. And then the second care was the care of the destitute, aged, disabled people. That care is adjacent to where we are here. Um, maternal leprosy. It's exactly what they are doing as well. Because there's no more leprosy, but they are taking care of the aged, the elderly, the destitute, and the disabled. And then the third care is care of the spiritually ill, which I would want to believe these are people suffering from inside, from different reasons, particularly today's world, where we have so many stresses, stress due to this, stress by that, and also these demonic problems and others that disturb people's spiritual life. And the fourth care is care of the caregiver. And the caregiver has to be cared for as well. 
These are the people who look after those disabled, destitute, aged, and look, uh, looking after the children. And those who are very seriously ill, who have no one to look after. And the fifth care is care of finances to run a simple community. Not a rich community, a simple community. But finances given to us by people of goodwill who donate, we have to take care of, the, of that money to run this community. You know, administratively wise, now we have a school, school for the children who go out and who are schooling here and uh, many other activities that go with the care of the children here. And then the sixth care is care of God's bounty, which is the land given to us, so that we become self-sufficient. Work, we use our own hands and work hard and produce so that we don't become dependent. We try and become independent like we do the agriculture we have livestock and we do the agronomy and vegetables and culture and so on and then the seventh care is care of the new order the new order <laughs> i'd want to believe is us the lay people uh, of all from all walks of life could be the married people uh, the um, widowed men and women, young and old, and even the religious people coming to join us as well. So those, this, this is the origin. This is how it originated, the Mother of Peace. We ended up here again. These were messages from the same lady. The first Mother of Peace community is in Johannesburg. This very same lady was uh, called by Our Lady to show where the chapel was to be built, which was the first one. And uh, the second had to be Mother of Peace in Zimbabwe. Now, she didn't know anybody in Zimbabwe, and it had formed, she and the other women had formed a prayer group about this Mother of Peace, what should be done, and so on. They were still praying about it. When she received another message to say, I want another Mother of Peace community, in Zimbabwe. He says, but I don't know anybody in Zimbabwe. Who do I tell about this? And then in that prayer group was a lady whose parents are live in Zimbabwe. He says, well, I have my parents in Zimbabwe. We can send a word and she can find out from there. And it so happened that they send a word and uh, the parents of this lady happened to have I mean, the, 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 the mother of this lady had a sister and her husband working at Mashambanzo in Harare, which was a place that takes care of people who are suffering from HIV AIDS and are destitute as well, the terminal ill. And uh, they heard about this and they said, oh, we'd like to start such a community. And then. They send a message back to say, oh, there's somebody, there are some people who are prepared to do so. And uh, they also said, well, we, we have to ask whether we are accepted. And when they send a message to find out whether they are accepted, our lady said, with pleasure, you start the comment, my children. That was Derek and his wife, uh, Liz. They all come from UK, but they were staying here in Zimbabwe. And then they said, but this is going to be a mammoth task if we are to look after the orphans and so on, and where? And uh, our lady said, I'll show them the place. I'll show my children the place in Zimbabwe. And they also invited their uh, colleagues, uh, their friends. They were together at Mashambanzo, you know, helping sister. A sister there was looking after the patients. And uh, they also said, yes, that was husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. McDonald. They also joined in. And uh, our lady said, I'll show them the place where it has to start in Zimbabwe. And then she said, it will be north of Harare, north, northeast of Harare. And it will be between two rivers. 
no, just like parables, she was saying this. Mm -hmm. And uh, since they also invited me to join them, these, the, 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 the two couples, I said, okay, because they said they needed someone to be a matron of this place. I don't know why they decided me, because I asked them, I said, why? They couldn't tell why. I said, okay. They said, no, you remain thinking. I said, when the wind came to you, did you remain thinking? Oh, no. I said, so you want me to be like Jonah? I don't want to be swallowed by a shark. The answer is yes. We do it together. And therefore, we decided that the place should be Chishawasha. We went to Father Dove. At the time, was the uh, principal of Chishawasha Mission School. And um, he said, I'll give you the place between the major seminary and St. Joseph. And we looked at it and we said, that's it. It's between the two rivers. We didn't say there's a river there. And uh, well, you know, and that there were two trees within that place, which, which are flat on top and are identical. Now, the answer when we send the message to say we found the place, the answer came is no, my children, it is not the place. The place is Mutema. Because these four came, I was not there that day, they came to climb Chigona Mountain and they saw various, shall I say, miracles or phenomena. They saw the sun spinning, it was about 11, 12, like this time of the day, spinning and with different colors. And it was not difficult into their eyes. You know, you can't look at the sun directly, but that was just as beautiful. They could look at it like this. And it was this, there was something coming out of the sun which looked like a host out back, out, back, it, it went on for a time like that and they saw the eagle as well and the eagle had a cross on it, a red cross and um, they had a little camera, not the sophisticated mm -hmm. cameras of today and Derek decided, now can I take, he took and it came like that and all they were wearing turned to gold particularly the rosaries which they had in their hands. They turned gold, and they saw gold raining on this mountain here, when they were up Chigona Mountain there. And it was now flowing like this, down the valley to where they were. I mean, it was all in their eyes, they were seeing all this happening. Mm -hmm. And finally, it sort of died down. And when it did, everything turned back to normal from gold that they were seeing, except the two rosaries remained gold. They were with, you know, silver chain, but everything turned gold. And later, after a while, the other one also died down, but one remained with gold always. And I used to show pilgrims that mm -hmm. Some pilgrims stole it no. and took it to the Moya. It just disappeared. It's no longer there. And uh, that's what our lady said. Didn't you see the phenomena in Motema? That is the place. And there was no doubt. Because Beverly doesn't know Motema. She's never known it before. And uh, that was that. Actually, Mr. and Mrs. McDonald, Norman McDonald was working, but that was almost like a way to say, resign and go straight away. He left his job to come and start this. But where in Matema was a question. At the leprous settlement, and they came there, finding out from the deacon who used to stay there, he said, there's no place you can start an orphanage here. These are just fields of the patients. Where can you put it? And uh, Norman went on to find out, he said, what is up that big mountain? Now thinking of what happened that day when they were up the mountain. 
and said, oh, those are farms. That's a farm. It's one of the farms. These are small-scale farms. Is there anybody in that farm? They say, oh, yes, there's somebody there. There's somebody in the farm. You can go and uh, find out if you want. But then he advised that if you really want to know much about that farm, go to the administrator, district administrator. He will tell you. I was not there again that day. They went to the district administrator. And the district administrator said, ah, oh, those are farms. But if you want to know more about those farms, it's, it's, it's a stretch of farms. You better go to the uh, district minister of lands. They are district officers at such a place here in Mtoko. And there, that day we went together. We tried, we found out from them and they said, oh, that place you are talking about is uh, that that mountain is called Mtema. That is Mtema Mountain. And the one that people climb on is Chikoda Mountain. And they, and they said, well, there is somebody there. We do not know whether he's the one that was allocated the farm or is he renting or whatever. You can only know when you go to the Ministry of Lands. They know all the people that were allocated the funds. Then we went, the two of us, Mr. Van der Seid and myself, we went to the Ministry of Lands in Harare and we asked about it. They looked in their books and they found that all the other farms were allocated except this one. By the way, our lady had said in her messages, the land that I'll give to, the, to my children of Zimbabwe is no man's land. It doesn't belong to anybody. And it was exactly that. So we said to the minister concerned, we would like to utilize that land for this purpose, we explained to him what we wanted to do. And he said, oh, we can go and start doing it. He said, that's a wonderful thought. And we said, but we heard that there's someone in there, there was somebody here. After. And he said, well, it doesn't belong to him, maybe it's just a, a, what do they call them, the people who just go and sit there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you are welcome to go and start. And that person will look for a place to give you in due course. But you go and start that. And we said, what about the list? Because they are list. And the list is here, here they were two, two, two and a half years or five years. Then we wanted to know for how long. He said, oh, we can give you a 99 years lease or 20 years lease, he was just perhaps joking or meaning it. He said, but if you want to buy the place, you can buy after four years. And that's how we got it. And uh, coming here, it was almost like a barren. This place was thorns all over. And we didn't know whether we were at the right place. And the sister to Beverly, came to visit. And when she visited, not at this place, just to visit up the mountain there, she pointed out and said, that is where you're supposed to be. And she showed where something white, which is that rock there, says where that white thing is, this is where the community is going to be. And this sister of Beverly was a twin sister. They were born being three triplets, one boy and two girls. And the two girls were so identical in almost everything that even the, their family was finding it difficult to, to make the difference. But she did not, she was not able to communicate with our lady. It was only Beverly. But she always asked Beverly every morning and said, did our lady talk to you about something like ABC? Did, you know? like, did she talk about children today? And then she would say, how did you know? You know, something like that. She says, no, I just felt. <laughs> and then she would give the message. Yes, she said, hey, baby, that, 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 that. And 
that was that. So that's how it came to be that we came to be here. We started from nothing, absolutely nothing. It was not easy and we stayed in caravans for others stayed in caravans for two years and I stayed in caravans for four years. I was in a caravan for four years. My colleagues were in the caravans for two years. Then we started to build bit by bit, bit by bit, to where we are today. We never advertised ourselves, but uh, heaven advertised it for us. People used to come and visit uh, us here and the children just felt for us. We started talking about us here. We started with two kids, two babies. One was actually dug from a toilet, was thrown in the Blair toilet. And the other one was full-blown HIV AIDS in hospital. The mother died there in the hospital and was there with the grandmother. Grandmother also died. So this child was actually brought to us from the hospital when she was two years old. And the, and the other one I'm talking about who was dropped in the Blair toilet was just a few months old, also from the hospital, but was severely disabled with hands folded and everything, legs, was a very disabled child. I think that's why the mother threw the baby in the toilet and I had a very small head and uh, we gave him the name Tinashe. Tinashe means God with us. And the doctor said if this child is to live, the longest this child can live is seven months. The disability was too severe. But the child lived up to 22 months due to tender loving care and prayer. We loved him so much. We have a big picture of him in the office. It's always there. And uh, then everywhere began to know about Mother of Peace. And the social welfare department was sending babies here, especially those who were HIV positive, whom they thought were positive because the parents died of AIDS. They just thought the child also has AIDS. Probably they saw how the child was physically or clinically and then this was the place to refer to all other homes didn't want to receive any child who was HIV positive AIDS but we had our arms open to those and people had the stigma they still thought oh, to be associated with AIDS so we had to make sure we open our arms and look after those as well this we said is the new leprosy and that's how we used to look at it, as a new leprosy. <laughs> because nobody knew that leprosy one day would be cured. And it started from a long time ago, before Christ. And now even AIDS can be cured in Jukos. And indeed today, nobody is actually dying of AIDS if they follow the steps properly. But if they abuse their, their instructions, then, well, it's their own fault if they die. The same thing goes for children. When you look at our children here, you will not believe when you see those who will tell you they are positive. They all look alike, healthy, happy, and together. So the, this is the situation with, I mean, the current situation. So how many children do you have today? Yes, we used to have children and we had not built. We only had a few houses and children were coming to us like those who were dumped, those who were, whose parents died. And so many children came to us, babies, and we didn't have anywhere to put them. You know, a bed, a single bed of an adult, we used to put about six babies across, across, across. And under, we put a mattress as well, some babies. 
and mother slept on the floor as well, the caregivers. There were so many and it was really hard, it was taxing. It was not an easy thing to do. We didn't have the milk, would beg here and there for baby formula, please baby formula. And there were people who were helping. But we didn't have any cattle for milk and nothing. Anyway, we continued. And phase after phase, with time, we had so many babies who died. Our cemetery, we have 129 graves of babies that die here. They died because of this disease. There was no treatment at the time. We were not allowed to test every child that came here. They were saying we are using them as pig, uh, guinea pigs. It was everywhere. I mean, there was this negativism a lot of it. And uh, also care. We needed specialized, specialized people or in-service training for mothers who cared for these children who were not well, so they died. But when treatment was started in 2000 and to the children now, the government was now accepting and everything was going on. The treatment was started in 2000, and I think 2002, to the children, and they started improving. By 2005, deaths had subsided. We were having deaths of children almost every month. One or two or even three children per month die. We were always with tears and going to bury children, going to bury children. But in 2005, it sort of subsided. By 2009, 2010, 2011, we are now in 2000, uh, 2012, we are now in 2013, the fifth year, we have not lost a child. None. God has blessed us. We just praise the Lord. We just thank the people who are assisting us in everything, in every aspect, the nutrition aspect, medication, and the positiveness of people who are accepting the whole situation now. And also other homes are taking children, they don't look at their status to say whether they are HIV or negative, HIV positive or negative, they just take a child in it. So people have changed their attitudes, thanks to God. Today, I can say children that have passed through this community, almost 500, because others have been reintegrated, others discharged, and so on, we passed through here. But we used to have 175, 180 children uh, at a time. But now, because of this reintegration and the health status changing, children, the children that we have in the community at the moment is 126. And, and you've got a school, isn't it? Which is we important. have now a school, Divine Child School. I gave it that name. That the Divine Child, the Divine Jesus, Child Jesus, look after the other children here. Look after our children and they should improve in their performance in school. And uh, since we withdrew them from the outside school. They have totally changed. They are brilliant, they are happy. The reports they used to bring to us sometimes with zero, 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 nothing because of the attitude outside there. Treated as orphans, as orphans, that sort of thing. But now, oh, they are very happy to have their own school here. We also take other children from the local community. And these are even more than our own children. This is what is happening. We have the, we have the primary school is only up to grade six at the moment, but we need to have get to grade seven, and we didn't have the money to build a block so that they can allow us to have a complete 
a total a private primary school. But mm, the Vatican has rescued us. Vatican. Whoa. Yes, the children, the uh, uh, Holy Child, oh, yes. they gave us the money to build that block. Okay. Yes. It just came this, this last month. Great. Thank goodness to that. But we asked for it in 2009. We had even forgotten about it. <laughs> this is the situation. Perfect. So once we have a, a really private school now, we can do what we like. At the moment, we are still a satellite school and another school. Yes. So what happens to the children which are old enough to start their own life? Can you help them to, to begin? Yeah, we do. We are helping them. In fact, the children are supposed to leave the home when they reach the age of 18. But we do not wait until they reach 18. We always send them back to where they came from. As long as those people are prepared to take them back and we help them whilst they are there. We are still giving them, we are still responsible for their school fees, responsible for their health, and uh, even build a house for them where there is no house for them. They are in the rural area where their parents are. You see that girl coming, there is a, a, a big girl coming. We built a house for her. She has finished her all levels now, and she wants to do teacher's training. But she has a house which means we have helped her. But for her to do the teacher's training, we still have to pay for her school fees. Yes, we do assist them. And those who can't make it academically, we send them to the skills training so that at least they gain something to help themselves in life. Yes, we do. <laughs> My name is Julie Jean. Uh, yeah. I came to Mother of Peace in 1998 when I was just uh, 15 years and I stayed with Mama Jean from that day until up to date. And I finished my education and I've been to South Africa and I was working for the founder of uh, Mother of Peace in South Africa because she had some chalets. She also do her own personal business for the family's upkeep. So I was working for her until now I come back for the project which is to start next week. So there are some Americans who are going to launch the organization here at Mother of Peace. So, Mother of Peace is going to be our umbrella. It's called uh, MBM, Micro Business Mentors. Micro Business? Mentors. What is that? What is that? It's all about uh, giving small loans to the local people of Motoko ah, okay. so that we alleviate poverty. So, at first, it was very difficult for me to live in the outside community because I've been used to the life of prayer. So most of the time I used to cry all the time. <laughs> I phoned by my chin and said, Mama, that's the same Mama. So she has been my, the pillar of my life. She has been there for me, you know, from the time I started to be here and until today, she's still my pillar. <laughs> No, yeah. it's like a mother, isn't yes, it? Yes. <laughs> it's always God mother. God given, God given, <laughs> truly. She's full of love. She is. Yeah. She's Great. a supernatural love, an <laughs> extraordinary person who does ordinary things in an extraordinary way. Now there are two of you, biggest challenges you are experiencing. Yes, the biggest challenges we have actually here is finance. And that's why the emphasis on income generating project so that we become self-sufficient. The salaries of our workers because we really have to pay their due. Sometimes they go for two months with nothing and the salaries are very little. We are just giving them little. If we have food sometimes we give them food in place such as rice, cooking oil, uh, meal meal. That sometimes we can give if we have. But if we do not have they get nothing either. But these people, I salute them because they remain very loyal and patient until we get some little money and we start to pay them again. That is a very big challenge. And secondly, for us to achieve those projects I'm talking about, we need to renovate 
our infrastructure, which had gone down because we were some some other time before we had really gone up until 2008 mm. when we had <coughs> these problems of the economy of the country went right down, the money changed and we couldn't even buy you know, chicken feed, nothing was possible. We had to slaughter all the chickens and give to the children to consume, to eat. Everything went down and for us when the economy started to come up again with different money from, you know, foreign currency. We are using US dollar. For us to where to get it and start again, it has been a challenge up to this time. This is the biggest challenge um, we are facing. We are facing at the moment in this in this community. Yes, we have also a challenge of. We have irrigation, but then the challenge is electricity supply. It comes and goes, comes and goes. And when it, it does that, it also burns a lot of stuff. And, you know, things are not just quite right. But at least we are better off. I thank the Lord for where we are at the moment. But these are the biggest challenges. Thank you. Great. Okay, ladies, I'm going to do something which I've never done before. I need to be in the camera. Wow! Uh, for the first time in my life, I will say something like that. Please, give these people money. I know there are some rich people out there. I know. So please, I never beg for money. But this is the best cause you can spend your money for. Thank Isn't you. it? Sure. Yeah, and you can see, there, there, there is the fruit, and there is yes. the reason. So it's working, it's working. It's really working indeed. Yeah, hallelujah, so please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Father. Thank you Father. <laughs>